but it's a pleasure to be with you all in New Orleans uh, today to talk about Tiger Beetle, a financial accounting database for Interledger. So whenever I fly into a city, I'm always struck by two things. Uh, it's the impact that two people have had on cities the world over, um, and especially when I fly in at night. So the first thing I see um, uh, when I see a city from a plane is the lights. Uh, and the second thing I see is the cars. Lights and cars. Thomas Edison and Henry Ford. They light up a city and keep it moving. What else do Henry Ford uh, and Thomas Edison have in common? And what has this got to do with Interledger and Tiger Beetle? So the more I think about it, um, the more I see that they share more than a few core ideas. And today I want to look at just three of these big ideas in just three words as they relate to Interledger and Tiger Beetle. And then I want to give you a quick tour of Tiger Beetle before we come into land. Uh, so I hope that by the end of our time today, uh, you'll be as excited as I am, not only about the power of three words to change the world, uh, but about Interledger's potential to do the same for the same reasons and the role that Tiger Beetle will play in making this possible. So three words, 30 minutes. Let's do a warm-up. So, and this is now Ask the Audience, right? So in one word, what do Thomas Edison and Henry Ford have in common? Who wants to go first and guess a word? General Electric, one word. Thanks, Alex. This <laughs> <laughs> is the best I can do. Yeah, it's a trademark. It's one, yeah, okay. Sabina, you, you've raised your hand also? Ah, okay, okay. Okay, in, in one word, what do they have in common? History? History? Inventors? Inventors? Patents? Patents? Okay. Networks accounting? Was that Bob? Accounting, accounting, accounting. Thanks, Bob. Um, Bob's a big reason for Tiger Beetle. We had this idea for an accounting database and spoke to Bob, and yeah, he was into, into that. So it was a big encouragement and awesome to meet, meet Bob here. Um, so shout out, Bob. Uh, it, and, and now everybody else, one word. What do Thomas Edison, Henry Ford have in common? Civilization. Standardization, wow, okay, I missed that one. That's not in my talk. <laughs> well, the word is there. Uh, okay, so I think that was fun. Um, let's do the first word, now that we're warm. Um, so I thought we could ask Edison and Ford themselves. Uh, let's open up the history books, hear it from them, and then spot the first big idea, uh, the first word they have in common. So first up, Edison, he's older. So, I never perfected an invention that I did not think about in terms of the service it might give others. I find out what the world needs, then I proceed to invent. Ford, I will build a car for the great multitude. It will be large enough for the family, but small enough for the individual to run and care for. It will be constructed of the best materials, dot, 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 but it will be so low in price that no man making a good salary, no man or woman making a good salary will be unable to own one and enjoy with this family the blessing of hours of pleasure. So did you spot the word? It's service. service. Well done. Uh, service. So for Ford, it was not about a car so much as it was about what personal transportation could do to change the lives of billions of people to keep cities moving. For Edison, much the same. In his own words, he started with service. He made all kinds of things because people had all kinds of needs. Uh, so like recorded music, movies, light, even electric power distribution, which is something we'll still come to. So it wasn't so much that Edison was an inventor, that he discovered so many inventions, but rather that he discovered so many needs and decided to do something about them. So he had a powerful motivation to invent because it was all about service. And so the more I read about Edison and Ford, the more I learn that the goal for them, in their own words, was service ahead of profit, with profit as a result, not a goal. 
as individuals, they were more excited about serving a massive need because they were more excited about making a massive impact. And I think in the same way, when we look at Interledger through the lens of service, we see that Interledger is more than an open payments network. That's how I used to think of Interledger. It's an open payments network. It's much bigger than that. It's about working towards a more equitable and creative global society through an open payments network. So it's not about the cars or the light bulbs, it's about the needs and the service. So just like Edison and Ford making lighter transportation affordable for everyone to unlock new experiences, Interledger is about perfecting the world of payments to make it affordable for everyone to empower new experiences. And this excites me again because service is a big idea. And Interledger is working through an open payments network in service of a global society. Interledger will connect people in new ways and empower anyone to seamlessly earn, share, buy, sell, and trade with anyone else in the world. So service is our first big idea. Two more to go. Second word. Perhaps at this point, you might be saying, sure, I like this idea of service, but Ford's quote puzzle, puzzles me. How is it possible for a car to be constructed of the best materials, of the highest quality, dot, 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 and simultaneously to be so low in price? Um, how is Ford able to simultaneously increase quality and decrease price? Uh, for example, again, he says, we have had just one main purpose during these years. And that is to give the people transportation of the most dependable quality at the lowest possible cost. So it sounds like Ford is promising the world the world. Uh, and perhaps, but when we look at Edison, we run into much the same problem. Uh, we will make electric lights so cheap that only the wealthy can afford to burn candles. And in fact, this is an extraordinary statement because to us today, uh, to grasp the full in impact and magnitude uh, we need to understand that Edison said this at a time when to light up your home, I mean, we've got a lot of lights in this building, but just to light up your home uh, with electricity, you had, to, you had to firstly be a banking billionaire, you had to own your own power plant in your garden somewhere, and your name had to be John Pierpont Morgan. Um, and yet today we take it for granted. If we own a car um, or when we switch on the lights, we think it's just so cheap. Um, and so how did they do it? In one word? Scale. Quite right, volume, scale, volume. So volume unlocks scale. If you have a lot of volume of demand, you get scale. Scale unlocks economies of scale, and economies of scale unlocks affordable pricing and high quality as production becomes, and there was that word, standardized. Uh, so both Edison and Ford understood the secret about volume, that volume is a business model all in itself. It's like, a, you know, we're going to do the, the volume business model. That, that was theirs. So, and in a biography that Ford wrote about Edison, and in fact, Ford once worked for Edison at General Electric. Uh, and later, when they were older, they became friends, used to go on camping trips together. Uh, but Ford wrote that in Edison's case, um, he would deliberately sell light bulbs at a loss um, just to increase demand, just to increase volume, just to unlock economies of scale. Because Edison wanted not only to create the light bulb, but to deploy the light bulb at massive scale. And here again we come to Interledger, um, which is an open, frictionless, currency agnostic method for transferring very small amounts of money typically referred to as micropayments. This open, did you spot micropayments? That means volume. This open network allows anyone to transfer money across currencies and ledgers, resulting in the potential rebalancing of our global payment systems. That is massive, like massive impact. Um, so the same thing that separates Interledger from everything else is the sheer scale and volume of transactions that Interledger processes. A single Interledger node can typically switch close to the same volume of transactions as an entire global card network. And this is because Interledger splits payments up into smaller transactions to de-risk payments as they are transported across the internet to enable new use cases and to reduce fees. So this means that with Interledger, you not only get cheaper 
instant payments, but also a better experience like Sabina showed. And again, volume is the key. So we have two words, service and volume. Third word and final word has to do with the difficulty of delivering on massive projects, especially when you can see the future of payments, but others still want faster blockchain. Forward. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And I think in payments, we're much the same space today. Um, so when you can see the future, but others can't, it's not enough to have the idea. You can't just write the spec. You have to go and build it. Uh, so chances are you have to build everything around it too, um, if people really are to use it. So outside of a laboratory experiment, uh, because the value of an idea lies in the using of it. For example, in the case of Edison, where other inventors had achieved some form of electric light but failed to make an impact at scale, Edison went further to deliver a practical and inexpensive light bulb, testing 3,000 designs of bulbs, 6,000 materials to find the perfect filament that would burn brightest longest. When others were thinking invention, Edison was thinking perfection. However, it doesn't stop there because Edison was a third order thinker. So as remarkable as the perfection of an invention is, the contribution that Edison really made was not the perfection of the electric light bulb, but the infrastructure for light. An affordable, long-lasting bulb was just the first step. Next, he needed light sockets, switches, the right kind of safe wiring to transfer power to the bulb. He had to get millions of people to wire up their houses. You know, it's one thing if you rewire your house. It's another thing when nobody has any wiring at all. Uh, and then he had to invent an electric meter to build them. So this was classic chicken and egg problem, but I think we can agree this was on the scale of mega chicken, mega egg. So how do you sell an electric light bulb to someone whose house has no electrical conduiting or distribution board? How do you light up a city where the city has no grid? How do you power a grid when the electric dynamo or power plant is not as affordable as you need it to be? So Edison's real genius then was to pull this together into a single integrated system. And in the same way, the contribution that Ford made was not only the universal car, but the infrastructure for the car, the supply chain, the entire parts economy. So you can imagine how many hundreds of parts went in even to a Model T Ford, and none of these were mail order. So if Ford wanted a suspension spring or a spark plug, he had to go and design it himself. Uh, and Ford was thinking of the universal car to render service to the great multitude, um, using volume to drive quality and reduce price. But he was doing this at a time when the automobile manufacturing industry, the infrastructure for the whole ecosystem, the whole supply chain, did not exist. So again, mega chicken, mega egg. And I, can, I, I hope you can see now where we're going with this when it comes to Interledger, uh, because our third and final word is... Sorry, Alex? Value? Uh, kind of, we, we, we did that one. <laughs> infrastructure, infrastructure. Uh, so, infrastructure. So like Edison and Ford, not only is Interledger going to change the world of payments to reduce fees, improve the experience, but it's doing this at a time when people still want faster blockchain, uh, when the infrastructure for tracking financial transactions at scale at least at the throughput demanded by Interledger, just doesn't exist. Uh, it's true that the scale of the internet has accelerated data infrastructure with companies like Google, Amazon, deploying hundreds of data centers around the world, developing new databases, running across these data centers to keep up. However, the same has not happened in the world of um, payments infrastructure because payment networks are not yet all open or fully connected. So we have yet to open the fire hose and when we do, we find that generic databases quickly fall over when exposed to high volume payments. Remember, service, volume, and the infrastructure is not there for this, this high volume, so they fall over. And that's because tracking payments is really about tracking money, and whenever you're tracking money, Bob, it's accounting, accounting. And the nature of double entry accounting is always contention. It's either on the debit or the credit side. So let me give an example to explain. Um, let's say an energy startup in Europe, they've got a million customers. Every 30 minutes, 
This energy startup enables its customers to arbitrage the cost of energy, switch energy in and out of the grid. So in other words, when the energy in the battery of the electric car is cheaper compared to what the grid is paying, it makes sense to sell back to the grid. So every 30 minutes, this energy startup is going to credit the accounts of these million customers and debit the account, account of the grid provider. So that's a lot of contention for the grid provider's account. Uh, you can shard the accounts of all the customers, those million. Uh, they can run on different databases, different infrastructure, but all million transactions have to hit the grid provider's account. So now imagine that energy is becoming more transactional. Uh, so instead of every 30 minutes, this energy startup is starting to switch energy every second. It makes sense, right? The faster you can switch, the faster you can settle, the more you save people money, the more you make an impact, the more you serve. Um, volume, volume goes up, good things happen. Um, but suddenly your database now needs to process a million transactions a second, all through one account. So to put this in perspective, uh, current database technologies, uh, when used as the foundation for a core system or ledger database like this, you know, often it's just a, a SQL database and then 10,000 lines of ledger code around it. Um, so the, the raw database might have raw horsepower, you know, like they'll say, oh, we do a million raw transactions a second as a raw material, but when you actually build double entry around them, they start to hit a wall because a thousand financial transactions yeah, the, the wall is a thousand financial transactions per second. That's like the finished product that you get out of a generic database. So this means that new payments applications of the future are a thousand times ahead or beyond the reach of current database technology, which means that as we start to look towards the future, we see that we have a payments infrastructure problem. So when you're thinking in terms of faster horses, the infrastructure problem is limited, but as you glimpse a future of Interledger, you not only need to solve supply and demand, you also have to forge a whole new ecosystem to power the service. So, and this is exactly what COIL is doing for Interledger. So in more ways than one, um, as we're seeing at the summit today, so with Rafiki, with Fainboss, uh, Dasi, others, it's all about creating a infrastructure ecosystem, helping people to deploy Interledger. You can't just have an idea um, you have to get this out of the labs. You have to deploy it at scale. So having looked at Interledger through the three words of service, volume, infrastructure, I'd just like to add three more words uh, and take us on a quick tour of a piece of open source infrastructure that's come out of COIL called Tiger Beetle. So it's named after the fastest insect on Earth, uh, the Tiger Beetle. Uh, it's designed to track payments um, with a thousand times more performance than existing ad hoc sticky tape ledger databases um, using a fraction of the hardware and with higher safety standards and a better, more predictable operating experience. Anyone can take this and it just runs. So Tiger Beetle is all about a great experience, mission critical safety and sheer raw power performance. Um, and I just wanna talk about th these three words now, performance, safety, experience, and we'll come into land. So while doing performance analysis on the open source Mojiloop switch, uh, together with Miller Abel and the Gates Foundation and other partners, at COIL we realized in 2020 that most switches use a generic general purpose database, like SQL, like I said, to track financial transactions. However, um, SQL doesn't provide the double entry primitives you need to do this. So for one transaction, you typically have to execute 10 to 20 uh, physical database queries just to process the logical business transaction. So if you're really good, some systems get this down to one database query, uh, but even then, as we've already seen, uh, there's still contention on hot accounts. Uh, so this means that these systems start to hit the wall, again, around 1,000 transactions a second, even on expensive hardware. So it's very difficult to scale um, a payment system like this when your core ledger depends on a generic database. It wasn't designed um, for the domain. So we therefore asked the question at COIL, we said, how can we go from one database query per financial transaction to one database query per 10,000 financial transactions? Because if you can do that, you've just made the system a thousand times faster and 10 times cheaper. So just 10,000 transactions, one database query, 
so what we did with Tiger Beetle was to change the way you talk to the database. So it's a simple idea. Um, instead of sending one financial transaction in a single database query, you send 10,000 um, in a single database query. So one query, 10,000. One query, 10,000. It just it's so much easier for the hardware. Um, and you can do this because financial transactions are small. So they're a date, a description, ID of debit and credit accounts, and the amount being moved. Um, you can pack 10,000 of these together into roughly a meg, um, and the database can write this to disk, and disks and networks really like it if you give them bigger pieces of work to do. That's like eating a big piece of cake instead of picking up all the crumbs one by one. So you get much more bandwidth. You also surprisingly get better latency uh, because your system doesn't build up long queues. So latency and, and uh, batching and latency and throughput are actually is more like a U-shaped curve. As you batch, you get decreased latency. It's better. Um, and uh, what we saw with Tiger Beetle is when you're starting to do 10,000 a second, you get optimal latency, optimal throughput. Um, so yeah, this, this design change means Tiger Beetle can start to think about you know, volume. Um, you can start to process towards a million transactions a second, even on commodity hardware. Um, and we might ask, well, who needs this uh, outside of Interledger? And one answer is that performance is actually a spectrum. So if you have high performance, you can trade it. Um, you can trade it in exchange for cost efficiency. So Lewis Daly did this. Uh, he's in the Mojolib community. He, ha he did a fun experiment. He took Tiger Beetle. He ran it on a Raspberry Pi, which is a super cheap um, mail order computer, and was able to achieve 94,000 transactions a second, where most enterprise systems can only do 2,000. Uh, so he did this on a super cheap Raspberry Pi. Um, and this was really remarkable because the storage that this Pi was using was an SD card. And if you have an old digital camera at home, it's that thing that's in your, it's not very fast. So the, the fastest are like 30 megs a second of high throughput write bandwidth, which compared to enterprise hardware is 100 times slower. So Lewis was going, I don't know, 1,000 times faster with 100 times slower hardware. Um, also quite cheaper. Um, so, and, but the thing is, with performance, it's not enough. Um, the faster we run, the safer we have to run. Uh, and from a safety perspective, obviously, generic databases that have been around for 30 years, tried and tested. Um, but the problem is when you build a ledger database around them, you lose those safety qualities because you, you're actually building a database, but you don't know it. So the core is, is tried and tested, but all these thousands of lines of code around it are, are once off ad hoc, everybody is reinventing. It would be much safer if we all share one open source ledger database. Um, so we also realized that it wouldn't be enough for Tiger Beetle to just be as safe as. Um, it, these technologies are 30 years old, so we had to look at all the research that was coming out and to design for the next 30 years. Um, and we'd need to obviously be 10 times safer. Um, so we'd have to have so much focus on safety that developers start to get nervous um, about using anything other than Tiger Beetle, even for their user comments, you know, or for data that isn't as valuable as, as financial. We, that was one of our goals. Let's make developers really uncomfortable that they're not using Tiger Beetle. Just have such a high focus on safety. Um, so our safety philosophy was taken from NASA's Power of 10 Rules for Safety Critical Code. Um, this is a standard you also don't see often in database code. Um, for example, we not only have the code that makes Tiger Beetle work, um, but we have all the code that while the database is running, it's checking the code. You know? This is like the friendly neighbor that's always coming to check. Uh, and we've got 3,000 of these checks in Tiger Beetle. So there's a lot of code just to check. Um, and if anything is slightly wrong, then the database will just shut down safely. So you know Tiger Beetle is either running safely or it's shut down. There's no other world where things are getting corrupted. Um, and speaking of corruption, it's been known in the storage research community that disks do um, corrupt data. So I don't know if you've ever opened a photo and the colors were noisy, or if you tried to open an attachment that was corrupt and you had to ask your, your daughter or son or brother, you know, can they help you out? Why can't I open this attachment? And they just say, well, it's corrupt. Uh, you know, or if you played an old CD with Led Zeppelin on it uh, and the CD was skipping, um, that's data corruption. And in the past, the surprise is that databases just said, well, we don't really need defenses against this because 
Um, the assumption was that the odds were rare. Um, but in 2018, the research really turned up the heat. It was a tipping point. And basically, Wisconsin Medicine showed that databases really do need to start changing the way they, they design, you know, the way they, they think um, about how physical disks fail, because the real world has systems that fail. So with Tiger Beetle, we try to take this research, implement it, and also test it. So just like a pilot would learn to fly a Boeing in a simulator, um, we built a whole kind of simulator for Tiger Beetle to run in. We can simulate all these kinds of hardware failures, check that the database recovers. We can speed up time. We can simulate 10 hours, 10 years of runtime in, in just a day. Um, it's a whole new testing technique that also other databases are not designed for. Um, so yeah, then we break the disks, we make the network go slow, and Tiger Beetle can self-heal and everything just runs. Uh, it's running so smoothly that Tiger Beetle just works, you know, and that's, that's really the goal of all of this, this infrastructure work. Um, the goal is experience, like a magical experience, goosebumps. So we want the new payment tech stacks of the future um, that run into Ledger to have a rock-solid financial accounting database underneath that just works. So not only can Tiger Beetle handle the volume of Interledger in service of Interledger's mission, to drive down costs, unlock new payment experiences. Um, but Tiger Beetle is also designed to be really easy to operate. It's like a thor thorium uh, reactor. You just switch it on, and at night you go home, you switch it off. Um, that, we've tried to make it so simple. Uh, it's just a single binary. You install it on six machines. You get a Tiger Beetle cluster, and the cluster runs smoothly, consistent performance, no matter what you throw at it. Um, and this is the dream now as we head towards a production release. And Sabina's question, we're really excited for early 2023. Uh, so it's not like one of those old light bulbs where the filament burns the glass black in seconds or one of those heavy steam cars where the boiler explodes on the operator, but rather it's a light for the future um, of payments through Interledger and a vehicle towards payment speeds never before seen. So it's been a pleasure to talk with you about Interledger's service, volume, and infrastructure. Uh, through the lens of Tiger Beetle's performance, safety, and experience uh, as we look towards a new future of open payments. And I'm excited with you uh, for this future to be switched on. This time, it's not up to Thomas Edison, but to another Thomas. So, Stefan, here's to you. <laughs>